So given Naughty Dog's established legacy with the Crash Bandicoot series already under their belt, in 1999, work was already being done to jack up Naughty Dog's next IP for Sony's next generation console, the PlayStation 2. While Crash Team Racing was being finished up, Naughty Dog had conceived the idea of an open world style game akin to those being developed by Rare on the Nintendo 64, with an art style inspired by anime and Disney cartoons. It was from this concept that gave birth to Project Y, which led to the creation of the duo we know as Jack and Daxter. However, an interesting little bit of trivia is that alongside this initial concept was a third character who was supposedly there to serve as a pet-like creature, but this was ultimately scrapped. Which leads me to believe that this rejected character was actually a beta version of the flop flop creature we see in the final game, but that's just pure speculation on my part. And so on the 3rd of December 2001, Jack and Daxter the Precursor Legacy was released onto the PlayStation 2 on what had to be the most kick-ass lineup that a video game console had ever had. I mean seriously, Silent Hill 2, Devil May Cry, Jack and Daxter, Metal Gear Solid 2, mwah, fantastic. And so, as per usual of Scully Reviews, let us grab a Pepsi and enjoy as we travel back to 2001 and discover what the Precursor Legacy truly is with Jack and Daxter, the Precursor Legacy. So the story kicks off with a monologue by Samos Hagai, the green eco-sage who speaks of the ancient civilization known as the Precursors and how they vanished eons ago. Anyway, it's from here that we're introduced to Jack, our mute, happy-go-lucky hero, and of course his wisecracking psychic, Daxter. The two troublemakers head over to Misty Island, off the coast of Sandover Village, and inadvertently spy on two evil-looking figures, one of whom is actually voiced by Twisted Sisters D. Snyder, and they're basically planning to attack Jack and Daxter's village with their armada of creatures known as Lurkers. Of course, having been spotted by a Lurker earlier on, Jack is attacked which, during the oncoming scuffle, Daxter is accidentally knocked into a pit of Dark Eco, which transforms him into an orange fuzzball, which will later become to known as an odd soul. Upon realizing what he's become, Daxter doesn't quite take this too well. <laughs> Upon returning to Sandover Village, Jack and Daxter seek the advice of Samos the Green Eco Sage, who, being the cranky old man that he is, scolds Jack and Daxter for getting into trouble as per usual. Unfortunately for the duo, however, Samos reveals that, well, there's nothing that he can do, and that the only one who studied Dark Eco long enough to have a chance of returning Daxter to his human form is Gol Acheron, the Dark Eco Sage. Ordinarily, this wouldn't be a problem, but Samos is unable to warp the two there because the other teleport gates manned by the other Eco Sages have been deactivated for some time. Time, leaving Daxter to travel across the Fire Canyon in order to reach Gold Citadel. And of course, that would have been fine too if it wasn't for the little problem of, uh, you know, burning to death. However, Samus's daughter and skilled mechanic, Kira Hagai, devises a way in which Jack and Daxter can travel across the Fire Canyon without being barbecued, which is via the use of a heat shield she created on a hover vehicle called the Agrav Zuma. There's just one little problem with that, however. In order for the heat shield to be fully powered up, Kira needs power cells, which are pretty much this game's main collectible. And so, Jack and Daxter set out to find power cells and restore Daxter to his human form. Well, we've got the brave adventurer, at least. Brave adventurer? You two couldn't find your way out of the village without training. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen, so rock stupid they can't even get out of their own fucking village. Anyway, after completing the training and collecting enough power cells, Kira jacks up the heat shield and the duo travel across the fire canyon towards the rock village. Upon activating the teleport gate in the blue eco sages lab, Jack and Daxter discover that the lab is in disarray and the rock village is being attacked by flaming boulders from a powerful lurker named Claw. And just taking one look at the guy already gives us the impression that this will be a bolder task than Jack could have ever anticipated. But the power cell hunting fun doesn't stop there, as Jack comes to learn from Kira that the Blue Sage had apparently been working on a device capable of removing the boulder that was blocking the path leading up to Claw. And of course, being the mechanic girl she is, Kira can get it operating again at the cost of 45 power cells. However, while collecting power cells, Samos comes to learn that the Locus are apparently excavating something deep within the swamps on the outskirts of the village, and prompts Jack and Daxter to investigate. Within the murky depths, they discover that the Locus have apparently apparently tethered a balloon to pull out some kind of precursor artifact from within the swamps. However, thanks to Jack and Daxter's efforts, it sinks back into the bottom of the swamp from whence it came. Anyway, after getting the power cells, Kira uses the blue Eco Sage's device to remove the boulder in which Jack and Daxter go in to face Claw. Upon reaching the Red Sage's Eco Lab in the volcanic crater, the gang encounter none other than Captain Howdy himself, who Samus reveals to be Gol Acheron the Sage and his sister Maya. 
as in the very same Golan Maya who was supposed to turn Daxter back into his human form. Gol reveals that he has kidnapped the blue, red, and yellow eco sages, holding them captive within the Citadel after they supposedly agreed to help him take control of the world, and of course use the Dark Eco as their means of doing so. The two go on to speak about how they wish to crack open the Dark Eco silo in order to obtain all the Dark Eco that they'll ever need to conquer the planet. Now, although I'm not really complaining about the story, since this is more of a light-hearted adventure, although one thing I do have to raise is that I kind of wish we had a little bit more insight into how Gollum and Maya were before they were transformed by the Dark Eco, you know, just to give a little bit more context into just how badly the Dark Eco had affected their minds. Granted, I'm sure this is a question that's probably better suited to fan theories and discussion and all that, but I think having some time in which Samos or even Gollum and Maya themselves could explain how they came to be so consumed by their own power fantasies, I don't know, I think it probably would have given a little bit more depth to what are already pretty two-dimensional characters. Anyway, in order to reach Golem Maya's Citadel, we need to make it through the Lava Tube, although the heat shield that we used during the Rock Canyon just can't cut it, so Kira suggests that we collect some more power cells to get a better heat shield. And thus our plot is arbitrarily extended. <sighs> fantastic. While exploring the caves for power cells, the duo find a precursor artifact that the locusts have been constructing which looks like some kind of giant robot. After gathering more needless power cells, Kira jacks up the heat shield and the two travel through the lava tube, arriving at Golem Maya's citadel where Kira informs Jack and Daxter that Samos has in fact been kidnapped. Upon infiltrating the citadel, Jack and Daxter run into Samos who explains that the Eco Sages have had their energies drained from them to help Golem Maya finish their heavily modified precursor robot, which is their means of opening the dark eco silo. And so so Jack and Daxter rescue the Eco Sages, and Daxter finally gets the recognition that he deserves. I'm Daxter. He's Jack. He's with me. Good job, Daxter. You're a real hero. Upon freeing the four Eco Sages, Samus explains that he and the other Sages will use their combined powers to lower the force field. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good start. And then after you guys open that shield, what are you gonna do about the robot? Nothing, Daxter. Which is basically the translation of saying, yeah, I can't be fucked. Anyway, when Samus and the Sages lower the force field, Gollum and Maya show up to jump into the Precursor robot and take off to crack open the Dark Eco silo above. While Jack and Gollum and Maya are pit against each other in the final battle, the four Eco Sages return to combine their blue, yellow, green, and red Eco to form the legendary element, Light Eco. But of course, this creates a moral dilemma for Daxter. Stay fuzzy, save the world. Choices. And so Daxter gets the light eco and returns to his human form, and Gollum Maya destroy the world. No, of course not. Daxter, of course, chooses to save the world after a few tense seconds, and then Jack goes supersonic. I'm the light bringer. I'm the fucking universe. Anyway, with Gollum Maya's evil plan sunk, the sun rises and the world is saved, to which Jack and Daxter do the Batman shimmy. Anyway, Daxter is now... apparently fine with being a not soul, and so that plot point is kind of wasted a little bit. But anyway, it seems like Gollum Maya might not be as dead as we think. Yes, Gollum and Maya. The Dark Eco probably destroyed them. Yeah. Probably. Spoiler alert, it really did kill them because they never come back in any way for the rest of the series. So the credits roll, and if you're patient enough to wait until the end, there's a little post credit scene. Ooh, is this the part where Nick Fury asks Jack and Daxter to join the Avengers Initiative? Well, no, as the gang turns their attention to a big-ass door on the top of Golem Maya's Citadel, which, as expected, requires you to collect all 100 power cells in order to open it. All 100 power cells, huh? Okay, sure, whatever, man, I'm game. I'm sure that whatever's behind this door has got to be worth painstakingly collecting all those power cells. Phew. I need a drink of Pepsi after that. Well, it took a painstakingly long time, and, well, it was kind of frustrating, to be perfectly honest, but we finally did it. We collected all 100 power cells, so let's see what's behind that door.
And now you see why I am not a completionist. Because why in the ever-loving hell would you make this your 100% ending?! I mean, yes, with the benefit of hindsight, this game does have a sequel, but I mean, just imagine if Jack and Daxter tanked upon release and Naughty Dog went off to do something else. Your 100% ending is a cliffhanger. This one pretty much just gives you nothing outside of, oh, just wait for Jack 2 to find out the answer. I don't know, I mean, maybe they could have just given the player a little something more than just a teasing ending like, you know, unlockable skins or cheat codes or, I don't know, I mean, just something that was worth the effort of collecting all those power cells. But, I digress. So, let's jump into the gameplay. Jack controls relatively well, if a little bit heavy at times, but essentially Jack is a more diverse Crash Bandicoot in terms of how he plays. Basic platformer moves are there, like the double jump, spin kick, punch attack, and of course some crouching maneuvers here and there, however Jack does have a few moves of his own to bring to the table. For example, by pressing L1 while moving forward and pressing X, Jack can perform a rolling jump where he can leap a long distance which also serves as a means of attack. Alongside this, we also have a lot of neat little touches to the combat, such as pressing square and then X for Jack to not only perform a basic punch, but then to have that lead into an uppercut. This is also combined with Jack's ability to use the four different colours of Eco. With Blue Eco, Jack can run faster, activate precursor technology such as doors and jump pads, as well as magnetise objects to return to their original state, and as an added cherry on top, you can also attract precursor orbs to your person. Yellow Eco is essentially the firearm power, which allows Jack to shoot fireballs at his enemies by pressing the square button. Red Eco, which strengthens Jack's attacks, and of course Green Eco, which restores his health. Out of all the eco powers you'll get the most use out of, it'll mostly be blue and yellow eco, as with the green eco it's usually scattered around in little clusters, and as for red eco its usage is surprisingly few and far between. Alongside eco usage we also have the other gameplay elements such as the A-Grab Zuma. With the Zuma, it controls relatively easily just by pressing X to accelerate and the left analog stick to steer. Oftentimes you'll be using the Zuma to travel across molten canyons and heated surface areas, although there will be the odd time where you use it to ram into lurkers and complete specific missions. So, while not exactly intrusive in the game for the most part, it is a change in gameplay that does freshen things up when it's necessary. One last gameplay feature I have to mention is the minigames, which in my opinion are the weakest link here. Now, while they aren't essential for a normal game run through, since considering the ending you get, you might as well skip these minigames entirely because they... kinda suck. One such minigame involves Jack and Daxter running into Batman here, and in exchange for a power cell, he has to collect 200 pounds of fish, as well as allowing the duo to use his bow whenever they wish. Not really sure why this is a problem, since considering the intro cutscene, Jack and Daxter pretty much just stole his boat anyway, but... Whatever. The fishing minigame here isn't necessarily too bad all things considered, although part of me does kind of pine for the big the cat segments of Sonic Adventure considering the lack of maneuverability here. What the minigame is based on here is timing and reflexes, in which you collect the green and yellow fish, which are worth around 1 and 5 pounds. However, you miss 20 pounds of fish and it's game over. And if you even collect one poisonous eel, then I'm gonna eat you all up for dinner! Nom 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 nom! Hey, be a fisherman! But the worst minigame out of them all has to be in the swamp area, where you have to help Hillbilly McButtfuck here get his pet hip-hop back named Farfy by luring him in with cupcakes, while also fending off the local wildlife by shooting them with yellow eco fireballs. And one of the biggest problems I have with this is the homing shots, which tend to be a little screwy thanks to the wooden support beams, and as a result, your shots have a tendency to miss more often than not. And considering the amount of creatures that are there, plus how hectic things can get, combined with Jack's rate of fire, which is, well, admittedly rather slow, it's gonna take at least two broken controllers before you beat this minigame. In terms of mission structure, Jack and Daxter handles it similar to many rare developed games on the Nintendo 64. However, I also draw comparisons to the Gexus in that so often in the game, each mission can be done in exchange for a massive collectible, which in the case of this game is power cells. To obtain power cells, it can be done in one of three ways. Paying for them with the precursor orbs that you find along the way, usually priced at around 90 to 120 orbs, finding them along the way of your adventure by means of progression, or by completing menial tasks with the different village people you meet during your adventure. From hunting down pets to defeating giant monsters, missions vary, so a dull and repetitive playing experience is more or less avoided here. Over to the technical aspects, this is where Naughty Dog started to hit their stride in terms of what they could achieve with the console hardware. For one thing, despite even being a 6th generation game over 15 years old- Oh, there goes that nostalgia hitting me right there! Either that or the Pepsi is starting to give me a heart attack, which considering my weight, I'm probably going to be suffering very shortly. There it goes! Anyway, besides the nostalgic tugging of my two hearts, this game to me looks just as good now in 2017 as it did in 2001 because not only does this game have such a vibrant colour scheme, but the way in which the world feels as you travel to each area in the game, 
It truly makes me feel as if I'd been on an adventure. It's so beautiful. From the snow-filled mountains, to the lush green pastures of Sandover Village, and to the blistering heat of the lava tube, each of these areas pop quite nicely and feel very memorable despite being very heavy on the video game tropes like grass level, snow level, etc. But one of the best aesthetic choices I think Naughty Dog could have ever made for this game was its use of a day and night cycle. For the sake of simplicity, I'll say this. Snowy Mountain at Sunrise is fantastic. Another point of praise that I will give Jack and Daxter the Precursor Legacy is the fact that there are no loading times, as this game is completely open world to the point where everything you see up at a high distance, you can pretty much travel to during the gameplay sequence. The soundtrack of the game is composed by Mutado Musica, the same guys behind the Naughty Dog era of Crash Bandicoot, and each track suits the area well. And while not exactly memorable in the traditional sense of a video game soundtrack, it's atmospheric and it certainly makes for nice background noise when you're traversing through these areas. In terms of voice acting, Jack and Daxter does pretty well for the most part. Characters like Samus and Kira do a decent job, and as do the additional characters in the game, but for me, the weirdest thing is how Naughty Dog somehow managed to get Kevin Conroy to voice the Fisherman and Dee Snyder as Gol Acheron. I don't know, I mean, Kevin Conroy is understandable to some degree, but I really have to wonder how the hell Naughty Dog of all companies managed to entice a glam metal frontman into voicing the bad guy for their video game. But honestly, considering that this is the same guy who once seduced Robert Ungland in his undies, I'm certain that Jack and Daxter was probably a massive career boost for Mr. Snyder. But I suppose the biggest point of praise I can give in terms of both voice acting and writing is Max Casella as Daxter, with more than a few wisecracking lines of dialogue whenever you fuck up and die. That looks like it hurt. Should I call for backup? I'm like, uh, Stretcher? Yuck. Revenant? While you're down there, um... Could you rub my feet? And while I do think the writing in Jack 2 and 3 give Daxter a little bit more leeway in terms of jokes, his presence in the more light-hearted Precursor Legacy makes with some pretty decent jokes, while also giving him a chance to get his ass kicked for being an annoying little shit. And so, with all that out of the way, what are my final thoughts on Jack and Daxter The Precursor Legacy? Overall, the first Jack and Daxter game is relatively by the numbers in terms of a collective platformer, but combined with some good looking visuals, atmospheric music, it delivers an experience that, even today, I'd say does quite nicely in immersing you into the world of Jack and Daxter. In terms of recommendations, if you enjoy collectathon platformers, a fantasy setting, or maybe you're just a big fan of D. Snyder, then Jack and Daxter will most likely be the game for you. So, on that note, I am Scully, keep it new metal, and next time on Scully Reviews, if you're an early 2000s kid, the next game I'm going to be reviewing might have a lot of nostalgic value for you, but we will get to that next time. So, catch you on the flip side. comes from watching too much Linkara and a tub the floor of the wall where bad comics burn like Linkara. Oh well, are you sitting around here all day? I've got questions. This thing's got the answers. Hopefully with some more straightforward answers because I'm starting to get real sick and tired of these vague riddles.
fantastic. Honestly, screw this. I'll grab a Pepsi.